Well, I, I want to say what an incredible honor it is to be here with Professor Ross and all of you Berkeley students. And the reason it's an honor for me is because for 25 years, I read about Berkeley. I read about the incredible reputation of this university in causing social movements. And social movements can change the world. And as I share this story with you, I'm going to call upon you to join me in working to change the world. Because before any of you were born, I was starting in a cell like that. But you can see it's very barren. It's very sad. I, I wasn't there for a reason that was unjust. I'm not like some of the uh, legendary scholars that you've read, Henry David Thoreau, who said, why is a just man in prison? He said, prison is the only place for a just man in an unjust society. No, I wasn't Henry David Thoreau. I didn't have the dignity and the character of any of you students in here when I was your age. Instead, I found a, I'm gonna try and use this, technology is rather new to me, but let me see if I do it correctly, and yes. That was my role model when I was your age, Tony Montana. I saw the film, I thought, wow, that's something that I could do, it was a bad decision. I wasn't thinking about the moral implications of selling cocaine, and that was before the crack epidemic had started in 1987. My only thoughts were, this looks like an easy way to pick up chicks, looks like an easy way to live a fast life, looks like a lot easier than studying through four years of Berkeley. I went through a period of time where it was kind of fun. I went through a period of time where I moved from my home in Seattle to Miami, where I had a cigarette race boat and had a flock of people trafficking in cocaine for me from Miami to Seattle. And that wonderful experience lasted for all of about 18 months. Now, I never had cocaine with me. I didn't have any weapons or violence or anything of that sort. And because I was telling other people what to do, I really didn't even think I broke the law because they didn't understand the criminal justice system at that time. I'd never been incarcerated before. I'd never known anybody as incarcerated before. Let me ask a question here. Should I show off hands if anybody doesn't know somebody who's been in prison before? So how many know somebody who's been in prison before? A neighbor, a cousin. You see, there's a majority here. In 1987, I can tell you, our country incarcerated far fewer people. And I'd never known anybody who'd been arrested. But our system of justice has changed. And it changed for me because I made bad decisions. And those bad decisions led to my arrest. My arrest happened on August the 11th of 1987. I was 23 years old, living in Miami. And I had been living this type of life for about 18 months. But never having gone through the criminal justice system before, I really didn't know what to expect. I really didn't have any concept of the moral implications of what I had done. And from my perspective, I wasn't too different from somebody who was around during the Prohibition era and ran a speakeasy. There was no violence in my crime that I knew of or that I was directly involved with. And there was no violence alleged against me. But because of the serious nature of drug charges in the United States of America, I was facing a sentence of life without parole. And the reason for that was because I was charged with a crime known as Section 848. It's otherwise known as the Kingpin Statute. Now, it's very easy to be charged with that offense. All it really means, it's a big word for saying that you managed five or more people, that you were engaged in at least three or more overt acts, and that substantial amounts of money were involved in the transactions. So in my case, all three of those elements were met, but I had a wonderful lawyer. <laughs> now, I know a lot of you guys are going to go to law school. When you go to law school, I want to encourage you to really think about doing the right thing. Because when I was a young man at 23, I placed all of my fate in my lawyer's hands. The only thing, I didn't care whether I was going to plead guilty or go to trial. The only thing I wasn't going to do was testify against somebody else. Because I had made the bad decision and I was going to do whatever my lawyer said. And he gave me some words that I don't know if I would call them wisdom, but they are words that reverberate throughout the legal system. With the right amount of money, you can win. And so I said, well, I'm cool then. It's all good. Ended up making some more bad decisions. And those bad decisions led me back into that cell. After I went through that period of advice from my counsel, I went through trial. 
And not only did I go through the trial, I took the stand in my trial. I stood up on the stand and I said that I didn't do it. I knew that I had done it, but I wasn't yet ready to accept responsibility for the bad decisions of my youth. I didn't even recognize them as bad decisions. When somebody's in the criminal justice system and you've got this fella here telling you that you can win, that's all that I wanted to do, was to win, was to go home. I didn't know what I would do when I would go home because I didn't yet have this experience of remorse. I didn't yet have this experience that said, I want to do something better for society. All I wanted was to get out of jail. Well, I went through trial. I was convicted. I was charged again for ongoing criminal activities that were taking place while I was in the jail. And it was at that point that I recognized what a colossal mistake I had made with my life. I was 23 years old. I had no idea how much time I was going to serve. All I knew was that I was facing a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. And so what does a guy do when he's in that type of a situation? In my case, you start praying. You start asking God for some guidance. And what I found was I got led to a book, a book that maybe you have read. I know that you're poli-sci majors or you're in this wonderful poli-sci class, not just for credit, as Professor Ross says, but because you really want to know the effects of political science in our history. And for me, it began with political philosophy of Socrates. Now, I came across this book when I was in that jail cell. And I was a C minus student in high school, probably should have been a D minus student in high school because I didn't pay attention. Never read a book from the time that I graduated in 1982 until the time that I was incarcerated in 1987. Probably didn't know how to spell philosophy, but I picked up this book because I was afraid and I was alone. And I knew that I didn't want this to be the rest of my life. Although it was going to be a big chunk of it, I knew I didn't want this. I didn't want to be a criminal, and I wanted at some point to be like you, to be a citizen. But I couldn't see what that meant, and so I started reading, hoping that I would find some wisdom in the stories of these people who lived thousands of years ago. And Socrates, when I read his story, it spoke to me particularly strongly. And the reason that Socrates spoke to me so strongly was because he was incarcerated. But he wasn't incarcerated for doing something stupid like I had done and driven by greed and bad character. Rather, Socrates was in prison because he believed in the power of education and of spreading knowledge and of helping every individual rise to his or her highest potential. But that was against the law in Athens. Because in Athens at that time, it was a class-based society. And the elites did not want those who were not a part of that class to learn or to educate themselves. So it was a crime. Socrates knew that it was a crime, but yet he broke the law trying to spread the message of wisdom. And for that, he was arrested, he was placed in jail, and he was sentenced to death. So I'm reading this, and I'm facing life without parole, and I'm saying, wow, this is really powerful to me, this story. It's not such a high level of language. It's really just a human story of somebody going through struggle, of somebody going through adversity. And so Socrates, he had this moment in there where one of his friends came to see him in the jail and told him, nobody wants you to die, Socrates. We have arranged everything for you. The jailer is going to open the cell, and all of your benefactors are going to support you and sponsor you in exile for the rest of your life. And Socrates listened patiently, and he said, well, thank you for that invitation, but I cannot go. And his friend said, what do you mean you can't go? Socrates said, well, I'm a Greek, and I live in a democracy. And living in this democracy, I allowed this democracy to clothe me and feed me and protect me from foreign enemies. And I have a duty to try and make this democracy better. Just like everybody in this room has a duty to make this democracy better. But in order to make this democracy better, we have to understand it. We have to be willing to step up like many of the, your predecessors at this great university have done. They've stepped up and they've taken action. And as I said, I'm going to ask you guys 
you women, you young women, to step up and take action because the story I'm telling you, it affects everybody in this room, whether you know somebody in prison or not. So Socrates says, I have to educate society. I have to become a part of democracy. And because I accepted all that was good in this society, I cannot run away just when the bad comes to me. I'd be a hypocrite, I'd be a coward. He said, I had the right to change the laws. I did not have the right to break the law. And as a young, ignorant, 23-year-old, driven by greed and the pursuit of a fast life, finally, I kind of woke up. And I recognized, wow, what a horrific situation I've created for myself. My grandparents didn't speak to me. My mother cried every time she saw me. My father, who was a strong man, would come to visit me in the jail and just look at me and say, why? Why did you do it? I didn't have to do what I did. And so I, at that moment is when the power of remorse settled upon me. And it settled upon me like a great stone, crushing me. The walls closed in, the ceilings and floors closed in, and I didn't know how I was going to get out. But I found inspiration in Socrates. And that drove me to read about additional philosophers and what they had to say. And I recognized that, wow, I'm in jail, I'm in prison, but this is really not a story about prison or about a victim, about what's going to happen to me, but rather about how can I find strength from within and contribute to this democracy from where I'm standing, from where I live. That became an idea for me, some kind of way. I said, I've got to find that way so that when I emerge from this system, I can become one with society. But I didn't know what that meant. What does it mean to reconcile with society? I can tell you that there are 2.3 million people sitting in prison right now, 4.30, standing up for count, having no idea what it means to reconcile with society. And as a consequence of that flawed policy, we have a system that costs taxpayers in excess of $75 billion every year. Where do you think that money comes from? It comes from educational system. It comes from each one of you who have a right to have an education because each one of you can contribute to the making of a better world. But our system of so-called corrections doesn't see it that way. Our system of so-called corrections does not communicate that message. And as a consequence, I said, how can I play a role in helping to communicate that message? Dude, what's your name again? Evan. So Evan, I, I met you. Come on up here, Evan. Come on up here. Evan's gonna be a lawyer. Evan's going to be a great leader in this country, and I had the good fortune to come up to Evan before this class and introduce myself to him, and so I'm going to ask Evan a question, because I was thinking about you, Evan, 25 years ago, before your parents even thought of you, okay? That's pretty good. I was thinking about you, dude, and I was saying to myself, is there anything that an individual who didn't kill somebody, who didn't use a weapon, is there anything that individual can do to reconcile with you? to say he's sorry, to redeem himself? It's a yes or no question. Is there anything? Sure. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Okay. Thank you. A big round of applause for our young Berkeley student. He's going to go on. Become a Nobel Prize. I heard there's more Nobel Prize winners at Berkeley than at any other university. You guys rock. You guys rock. And I want you guys to join me in rocking this prison system. If society is gonna allow an individual to reconcile, that individual has to educate himself. That's one principle, fundamental step the individual can take. But there had to be more. And the second thing I thought I would have to do to carry me through this journey, and I didn't know how long this journey was going to be, would be to contribute to society in some kind of way. Society inside of prison, and outside of prison. And the third principle that I thought tax-paying, law-abiding citizens would want an offender to do is to develop a support network that would have a vested interest 
in his success upon release. If an individual followed those three principles, I believed the possibility existed that as time passed and as society they had more temperance about values and recognized that marijuana or cocaine is not quite the same thing as murder. So in my case, it was only consenting adults that were involved with me, but because of my crime, I'm responsible for everything that happened. Okay, I can own that. My job is to try and follow those three principles, which are to educate myself, to network and build a support system that might have a vested interest in my success upon release, and to contribute to society. If I can follow those three principles, I believed or I hoped that I could get through that journey. And I didn't know how long that journey was going to be until my judge slammed the, ha the final hammer down and nailed me with 45 years. Now when I got 45 years, never having been in prison before, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if that meant I was going to be in prison for 45 years. But so I go into this wonderful system of corrections with correctional officers but I didn't find any emphasis on corrections. And I didn't find anyone who cared about my newly planned three-part principle. So I had to work, not on the beautiful, magnificent campus like this one, but in an environment like that one. Reminds me very much of the United States Penitentiary in Atlanta, where I began serving my term. It was a penitentiary that was built in the 1800s, and it's a penitentiary with a 40-foot wall around it, and it was a penitentiary that I had to walk through many, many puddles of blood to get from one point to another. Because it is a penitentiary where the culture of failure is deeply invested upon, and nobody makes an investment in the culture of success. In fact, the prison environment in America today is as close as we come in the West to communism. Now, as a political science class, you may be somewhat familiar with communism, where there is no private property, where every individual serves the interests of the state, where an individual is told what he can or cannot become, and where every individual is expected to perpetuate a cycle of failure. So we'll get into that a little bit later, but that's where I began. It could be an environment that could extinguish hope for some people, but I had those three principles. I had those three principles and I had this vision of one day standing in front of a great audience like this at one of the greatest universities of the world. And I had role models like Malcolm X. Now, I know he's a controversial figure. I know a lot of people don't like what he stood for, but I was a prisoner. And as a prisoner, I identified with anyone who lived in chains, with anyone who had a vision and a passion to overcome and break away those chains. Malcolm X, as I did, began his sentence in ignorance. But he educated himself. And I was inspired by the way that he educated himself, recognizing that the power of language could inspire people to change the world. And I know that every one of you guys are sitting in this class who chose to go to Berkeley instead of Stanford, instead of USC. You came here because you wanted to change the world. Don't give that up. Live up to the legacy of this great institution and recognize that prisons are a great social injustice in this nation. And we require help. Just like we required help to abolish slavery. Just like we required help to bring women's rights. Just like we required help to overcome every fascist movement that has tried to rip liberty out of your young lives and turn you into machines, as that famous former Berkeley guy said, wasn't he, Mario Salvo, I think is his name? Been watching him on TV for the last couple of days, saying, wow, if I could live up to that guy's free speech movement. But Malcolm inspired me because he inspired me to recognize the power of language. And when I went to prison, I didn't have the gift of language. I didn't know how to write a sentence. I would start the sentence up here and I would finish it down here and you know, put a period and it was all good. But of course, I later learned that that's called a run-on sentence. It has no structure and I had to learn to change. He helped me recognize the importance of that message. And this man, 
Viktor Frankl, who was a prisoner of the Nazis, who lost his family on his first days of imprisonment, who served three years in the Nazi death camps, but every day he had passion. He had passion to try to help other people find meaning in spite of the struggle of his current environment. If Eli Weissel and if Viktor Frankl can overcome the Nazis, I can try and overcome this environment that I have to live in. And they were inspirations to me. And so those inspirations led me to start writing and say, how am I going to become an educated man? How am I going to develop the skills so that I can someday communicate and share this message of social injustice with the world? I recognized my three prongs required me to educate myself. But of course, prisons are not institutions that focus too much on education, so I had to reach out. And that was my university. In fact, that's the first time I've seen that university, a picture. It's Mercer University in Atlanta, Georgia. And I have to write to professors there and try and persuade them to educate me, to allow me to enroll in college. And at that time, before we embraced upon this new, kinder, gentler America, we had Pell Grants that were available to all poor people, and I was a poor person sitting in prison. And so I qualified. That was all that was required to qualify for the Pell Grant was that you didn't have an income, and I didn't have an income. Unfortunately, in Congress's infinite wisdom, it did away with that Pell Grant, and so we have far fewer people in prison working to educate themselves today. Instead, we have a huge investment in locking people up, warehousing humanity. But I was fortunate, and I was able to get through four years of Mercer University, and I wanted to continue. I had hopes of going to law school, not because I wanted to be a lawyer, but because I wanted to make some type of a difference in society, and I had hoped that a law degree would help. But I wrote to every law school in the nation, asking for an opportunity to enroll and to study. And unfortunately, they all wrote back and said that in law school, we study in the community of scholars through the Socratic method. And since I couldn't participate, the American Bar Association would not allow me to go to an accredited law school. But one of the professors, somebody friendly like Professor Ross, wrote me back and said he was touched by this effort to educate myself, and he allowed me to go into a graduate program. It was Hofstra University in New York, another school that I never saw until I saw Barack Obama debate at Hofstra. So I was kind of intrigued now to see the internet and be able to see these images of places that had this enormous influence on my life. Although they couldn't allow me to go into law school, Hofstra said, we'll allow you to get a graduate degree if you can get past a probationary period. What would you like to study? And so I said I wanted to study the prison system. I wanted to try and make a movement to change the prison system. And they said, fine, we'll structure a program for you. And I got through it with an emphasis on cultural anthropology and political science. And I got my master's degree in 1995. And after that, I started working toward a PhD at the University of Connecticut. Through my work at Hofstra, I met many of the most distinguished penologists in the nation. And they became mentors of mine. One of them was George Cole, who was the dean at UConn. He was going to allow me to get into the doctoral program, studying political science with an emphasis on prisons. I went through the first term, but then the iron boot of corrections pressed its foot down on my neck, and that was the end of my formal education. Because the warden said, you already have more education than our staff. We are not here to educate you. We are here to incarcerate you. And so he put a stop on it. And at that time, I only had about eight years in on my sentence. And I can tell you that at that moment, I was as ready for release as I ever would be. I was 35 years old. I had a master's degree. I was in a doctoral program. I had a huge network of support. And I was ready to come to society as a law-abiding citizen. Taxpayers had already spent several hundred thousand dollars to incarcerate me. But it meant nothing, because in our system of corrections, we invest in failure rather than success. It is fundamentally different from that 
wonderful environment in Silicon Valley where many of you guys are going to go on to build great fortunes. It is fundamentally different from this great university that rewards excellence. That prison system is a system that invests heavily in failure. And you don't have to take my word for it. A little bit later here, I'm going to throw up some statistics that everybody may recognize. So I didn't know what I was going to do, not being able to go through education and yet still having 17 more years of prison to go at a cost to taxpayers in excess of $40,000 a year for every year remaining that I would have to serve. And I would have you remind you that that's $40,000 a year less that would be going to educational programs. That was the environment in which I had to educate myself. Continuously being observed, not having one day of privacy for 9,135 days, seeing the platitudes all around about just reach for it, just go, you can do it. And at the same time, having the iron boot of corrections stomping down on a man's neck. You see, in the United States of America, we like to point our accusatory fingers at other countries for violating human rights. But what are human rights if it's not a right to educate yourself? If it's not a right to communicate why $75 billion a year are being squandered to perpetuate this prison system instead of investing in the bright young minds that are sitting in this room today. Why? Who's benefiting from that system? That was my mission to find out. And it was my mission to overcome those boundaries that held me, to break the chains and to live up to the expectations of those who believed in me. And so that led me to write my first book. It's about prison. When I lost my ability to continue with education, I reached out to one of my mentors, George Cole, at the University of Connecticut, who was the leading textbook author on the criminal justice system. He has several books out. And during a visit, when he came to see me, he said, why don't you write a story about your observations in the first decade of prison? And we'll sell it on universities so that students would get not only a theoretical view, but also a very practical, personal view. It was a great opportunity for me to further my mission of contributing to society, and so I embraced upon that opportunity with great enthusiasm. But of course, I didn't have the wonders of technology. All that I had was a 39-cent big pen, a piece of white blank paper, and an indomitable will not to let that system crush the life out of me. Just like I'm asking each one of you, don't let the machine take your soul. Don't forget why you came to Berkeley. Take action. And so that led to my second book. This book is about my own experiences through the journey. This book was my second book, Profiles from Prison. And it's a story of my brothers, all of my brothers who are in prison, who are squandering their time and their life away because they didn't get the blessing of meeting Socrates early in their term. And so instead of preparing themselves for success, they're succumbing to this culture of failure that we place so much emphasis on. You see, we tell those in our prison system to succeed, but we take away all of the tools of success. It's as if we lock them in chains, throw them into the ocean, and tell them to swim to shore. And when they sink, they say, well, we did everything we could. It's the correction system. We're a correction system. In the state of California, the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, it used to just be corrections. But now they've put the word on it, rehabilitation. They didn't change any of the policies. They didn't change the system. They just kept it going, kept sucking money out of the budget that should be going to education, to health care, to infrastructure. I considered it was my objective and my duty to try and change and to try and continue working to build my network. Through these books, I reached out. And the books started becoming used in universities across the country. 
And so I had an opportunity to interact with many professors, that by continuing to write and just share my story, I was able to transcend the prison system and to bring the world into my life. And you see, I really scored a smoking hot woman to come and marry me <laughs> ten, you with 10 years in prison to go. And she became my liaison to the world, and she's sitting back there. Give her a round of applause for Carol, who served 10 years, not because she did anything wrong, but because she loved me. She committed the crime of loving a prisoner. And she moved across the country whenever the system tried to transfer me. Didn't try, it did numerous times. She lobbied on my behalf whenever I tried to reach out and say that by shutting down my voice, you're not only infringing upon my First Amendment rights, you're infringing upon the taxpayers' First Amendment rights to know what's going on in our prison system. And so, with Carol's help, I launched my website. I documented my entire journey through prison to try and show people that in order to overcome this system, you have to take a principled path. You have to take a vested interest in success. And so it was that motivation that guided me through 9,135 days, and it led me to write about it in this book. It's very graphic. I know you're young and impressionable, so you don't want to read all the dirty words and the gang and the corruption and the sex that goes on in prison. But if you do, that's the book to read. <laughs> this is the book that I've written since I got out about five months ago. And it's the story of my journey, the story that I just shared with you from the day of my arrest on August 11th, 1987, to the day of my release on August 13th of 2012, and everything that went through along the way. And how did I do it? I did it in the same way that I'm gonna ask you guys to live your life, to lead a values-based life. Say what is important to you and clearly define the goals that define each one of those values. I have a total course I go into, the straight A guide that talks about attitude, have a 100% commitment to success, aspiration, see where you wanna go. For me, I always saw myself standing on a stage like this and sharing my story with you. Action, take the incremental action steps that will lead you there. Hold yourself accountable with clearly defined timelines and clearly defined limits of success so that either you succeed or you fail. Understand accountability is crucial, but it also leads you to awareness. Two prongs with awareness. By leading this straight A guide path, an individual becomes aware of opportunities that he can seize, because all the opportunities that opened for me were open for every man in prison. Simultaneously, become, the marketplace becomes aware of you. Just like Professor Ross reached out to me and invited me to come and speak with you guys because he became aware of me. Three, you celebrate every achievement, no matter how small. And four, you express appreciation for the enormous amounts of blessings that come your way and the people who help. We could talk about that for a long time. I was inspired by this man, Mahatma Gandhi, who also told us all to be the change that we want to see in the world. If you want to see change in your own life, understand the world. Understand why our nation's commitment to mass incarceration influences you all because of corporations like this, Corrections Corporation of America, whose revenues increase and whose profits increase by doing what? Taking away your money and using it to lock more people in cages. We have 2.3 million people in prison. Do you really think that none of them can contribute to society? Is time the only way we can measure justice? Or would justice be better served if we measured it not by the turning of calendar pages, but rather by the efforts an individual makes to reconcile with society? What would you rather have? Somebody who did 10 years, or 20 years, or 50 years watching TV, playing spades, and keeping up with the Kardashians, Or somebody heard who served seven years? and came out as a law-abiding, contributing citizen. I can tell you, this company and the lobbyists who represent it, they want to take your funding. 
and keep it going into the prison system. You see, in California, in 1977, you had 19,600 prisoners. 2006, that number went to 173,000 prisoners. Do you guys feel safer? The prison system is a wretched system that affects every taxpayer. But this company controls the message. And that's why every time you see the opportunities to legalize marijuana, it is drowned out. But we live in different times. We live in times where we don't have to see education funding since 1980 being cut by 13% in today's dollars. And the prison spending being jumped by 436% in today's dollars. Nelson Mandela, one of the few people who I can identify with because he did serve a quarter century in prison, although he is a global leader, revered around the world, and I wouldn't try to compare myself to him, I will say that he was an inspiration for me, and because of his commitment and his passion, he worked to change the world. But he couldn't have done it without people like you. You guys remember this picture. I pulled this off of YouTube also. It's right outside of Wheeler Hall. They're protesting your guys' tuition hikes. And these guys want to change that, you know? I don't know if they've got second positions with Corrections Corporation of America, but I feel a great sense of animosity for anybody who believes in taking away money from our brilliant young next generation and using it to lock people in cages. But today we have the social media and every one of you are experts in the social media. Those of you who follow Quora may know that there's a great project called The Last Mile in San Quentin. And if you don't, I really urge you to log on to The Last Mile at San Quentin because the founder of that program is in this room tonight. And what he does is he believes in the prison population and giving them a voice to get out, to break out of San Quentin and share with the world what goes on inside of that system. And how does he do it? By helping them reach the social media, helping those guys share what the prison system doesn't want taxpayers to know. The reality is this, two or three years ago, nobody ever would have thought that the Middle East would have crumbled. Twitter made that happen. Those of you who have read the Facebook effect know that the Facebook system was instrumental in doing a part with a terrorist organization in South America known as the FARC. How does that happen? By spreading the news. I have a purpose, but I am just one cog, one part of a team. I am asking you to join my team, to work with me as I work with this young man, young stud who's now working as a city council member in Stockton, just graduated from Stanford. He went back to the city where he was from and he joined partnership with that great company, Golden State Lumber, to try and help young people who are in prison emerge as law-abiding citizens. And I'm very proud to be working with Michael Tubbs and with Golden State Lumber in an effort to try and improve society. But it can't be done with one councilman and one corporation and one long-term prisoner who screwed up his life in 1987. We need the bright young minds of this university and all universities to join me, join me on Twitter, join me on all of these social media platforms and help me spread this message of the wretchedness of America's prison system and the glory of America's education system. That's all I got. Thank you very much. <laughs> Five o'clock. <laughs>